السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته today we'll be talking about the first chapter in the SVAC course okay uh, the first chapter is talking about the basic know-how the basic know-how will talk mostly about as the foundation of the SVAC related to uh, abbreviation related to uh, temperatures related to heating so it's mostly building the foundation that you will need later in the other chapters as well okay starting with this foundation course of foundation chapter we'll talk about the different type of thermal energy okay so we'll talk about different type of energy we have something called radiant energy like what like the solar energy come from the sun we have chemical energy like the one that's coming from the batteries related to chemical combustion among different materials we have also magnetic fields field that they could also provide energy using the current bearing coils that store energy like the dynamo as an example you have electric fields okay you have also kinetic or motion energy that's coming from the motion you have potential stored energy which are saved in some devices electric energy nuclear energy from atomic combustion or thermal energy from heating the air as an example or hot water okay so a lot of different type of energy in our lives here are only talking about the different type of energy okay then we go to the aggregate status. Here he wants to tell you that if the material is heated, heating meaning that we are giving them a lot of thermal energy, more thermal energy. Okay, so if we have thermal energy coming, then the material itself, the, the relation or the binding among the molecules itself will get becoming aggregated. So it will be heated. So this relation or bond is going to somehow loosen at my break which will allow the state of the material itself to be different. So if you have a solid material and you give it a lot of energy, then it will go to gaseous status, so it will become evaporated, or it will go to liquid status. So the normal way from solid will be melting, okay, becoming liquid, and then with more thermal energy to the liquid state, it will go gas, okay, and if you start cooling it down, meaning that you are absorbing energy from it, Okay, then the bond among the molecules will start again to uh, be solidified. Then it will go from gas status to liquid status, okay, and vice versa. So sometimes it's from this state, from solid to liquid to gas, and then depending on the temperature, it's vice versa, okay. So from solid, it will melt to become liquid. Then it, can, it will be uh, evaporate to become gaseous, okay, and then... It can go vice versa depending on if you are giving it thermal energy or taking a, a thermal energy out of it, okay? Then we'll talk also about, as you can see, this, is, this chapter is mostly about a lot of topics, okay? They look now that they are not bound together, but once you start taking the other chapters, you find that they are linked together, okay? So here we're now talking about converting temperatures. We'll talk, be talking about the different temperature units or dimensions we have. So we have the Silesius temperature, which is the easiest one. Why it's easy? Because it's suitable to our life. So in a simple way, a zero Silesius temperature, meaning this is the temperature when the water will be frozen, when ice will be formed. A 100 Silesius, meaning that the, that is the temperature when the water will be boiling, okay? So the Silesius scale is determined by two defined points, zero C, is fixed as the freezing point of water. 100 C is fixed as the boiling point of water at one atmosphere of air pressure because this will be depending also on the air pressure. Okay. This is very fine, but then we have to talk also about something else, another unit for temperature called Kelvin. And Kelvin is more used in the scientific, let's say, calculations. So we see it a lot in our course as well. And in a very simple way, a Kelvin or a Kelvin, so as an example, here this is the T, and the T is the temperature in Kelvin. So the temperature in Kelvin is the temperature in Celsius plus 273, okay, and vice versa. So if you have 100 degree in Celsius, okay, then it will be in Kelvin, 373 in Kelvin, okay, and vice versa. If you have a, a 293 in Kelvin, or it, 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 you want to convert it to Celsius, then it will be 20 degrees 
in Celsius, okay? And this is the simple equation for that. Then another equation as well is the Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit uh, connection is using this equation. So there is a part of 1.8 and then plus 32. So if you have a temperature in Celsius, which is which one? This is this one. Yes, temperature in Celsius. If you have it in Celsius, okay, and you are converted to Kelvin, you are converted to Fahrenheit, then you have to use this equation. So 1.8 multiplied by 100, and then plus 32, okay, then you get 220, uh, 212 in Fahrenheit. So this is how you convert from Kelvin to Celsius and vice versa, and from Celsius to Fahrenheit and vice versa. And you will have these equations also in the PDF as well, okay? So this now you know how to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit and from Celsius to Kelvin. So if you want to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, uh, sorry, from Celsius to, from Kelvin to Fahrenheit, then you can take it the vice versa. You convert one of them to Celsius and then you convert uh, from Celsius to the other dimension as well. And as we said, we use mostly the Celsius in our daily life, but when it comes to calculations of scientific calculations, we use the uh, Kelvin one. Now we're talking about the heat quantity or thermal energy and temperature changes. That we say that the materials above zero K, zero K is zero Kelvin, and this is a specific one. And we say that when the material is at minus 273, which is the Celsius, which is at zero K, mean that the material has no energy at all. Okay. And as based on the on the material of the KNX, this is the lowest temperature in life. Okay. And uh, at this temperature, the material, the, the vibration in the atom itself, molecules in the material itself, is stopped. So this is an absolute temperature called zero K, which is minus 273 Celsius. Okay. So all materials above zero K contain the heat, and when thermal energy is added, when you add heat, okay, then either and the temperature perceived or felt heat is increased, the aggregate state will be changed, of course, which we said before that it might melt or evaporate or the vice versa. And this is the equation governing this. So if you have the heat quantity, which is the Q, and you have C, and C, by the way, this is fixed for the material. So you will find the table coming later, fix it for this material. So the specific thermal capacity of a material is C. Then you have the mass temperature difference. And then we have the equation governing that. How we calculate the heat, it's based on what second or what hour or kilowatt hour or joule. And we'll come later about the calculation of that. How we calculate the specific thermal capacity of a material, which is how much thermal energy the material can store. Okay, the material is required to heat one kilogram of material by one kilogram. Okay, and this is how you calculate it. And this is fixed by the material itself. So for the H2O, you have different C, depending on the material you are using. Let's see how this equation is working. Come here. You can see that units of energy, various different units of energy are commonly used for heat quantity. We can use the uh, uh, what, what second, what hour, kilowatt hour, joule or kilojoule. It's easy to convert from one another. So one joule is equal one watt second. Here you can convert from either of them. Okay. And as you can see, energy is mostly expressed by joule, but exists by watts, okay? And energy also can be executed but by watt second, okay? This is a calculation. The example is saying that the circulation of pump moves the water volume of 0.5 liters per second, okay? Which is, for me, I can get from this, the M, the mass. And the flow temperature, Okay, is 50C, so the water going one direction is 50C, and the return flow is 35C. Mostly in the pumps, we'll have one pump pushing water to heat areas, and then this water is circling back as a flow, as a flow back. So definitely the water going out of the pump will be hotter than the water coming back. And this is a different loss, which is between the 50C and 35C. If you try to use the, my equation, my equation is saying that Q equals M multiplied by C by delta C by delta temperature of delta theta. 
Okay, so water mass will be m. Okay, you convert it from liter to kilogram per second, multiplied by 3,600. 3, 3, then you'll get it in kilogram. Okay, then the specific thermal capacity, the C, for the water is like that. It's 4.182. It's based on tables, by the way. You get the tables in the PDF. Okay, then you start putting the temperature difference in here, which is 15 C, okay, or 15 K. And then you start putting those values in the equation. You got the, the heat quantity you are looking for, which is the Q, okay? Very simple equation. Don't need to really to know the calculations of that, by the way. Normally, you don't need to know that. But you need to know the basics of what the, what's meant by uh, Kelvin, what's meant by Celsius, Fahrenheit, what is the difference, okay? That will make sense for you. But you you, you will never be, uh, have to do this calculation in the field. They are engineers doing this. You just need to know, understand how they go. This is a specific thermal capacity that the table I'm telling you about. And you can see this is the one that we used for the water, which is 4,182. 4, and depending on that, by the way, you can see that the water itself has a very high thermal capacity. So it can store more energy as other material, okay? So they can contain particularly high amount of energy. Then this is the equation for thermal output, something called thermal output or Q dot. Thermal output means the heat quantity transfer per unit of time. Output P is generally defined as work or energy E per unit of time. So work per time or, okay, will give you the P, the power here. Thermal output is a special form and is defined, is denoted by the symbol Q dot. Following is true that thermal output, which is Q dot that I need, equal to heat quantity, okay, divided by time unit. So Q dot equal Q by T, okay, you can take it the other way around. Q dot is thermal output, okay, it's per time, so it's watt or kilowatt. Q itself is heat quantity in watt second or kilowatt hour or kilojoule. Time is in second or hour, depending on the calculation. Do I have to do any calculation for that? No, you just need to understand that there is an equation doing that. Then you move to another part, which is the heat load calculation, meaning that to allow comfortable zoning in your house or your villa or your office, then there are some standards saying that the optimum temperature should be like that in the room. So the kitchen optimum temperature should be 18C, the bedroom optimum temperature should be 18C, okay? Depending on that. And these standards are mostly on worldwide standards, depending on the country itself. So in Europe, it should it might be like that. In the Middle East, it might be a different one. Then we move to humidity. And the humidity in, in general is very simple way. We see humidity every day in our life, by the way. When you are uh, early in the morning on the glass of your car, on the windshield, you'll find water there. This is evaporation coming from humidity. The humidity is simply saying that the normal air that we are seeing, the air, this this air can also have some kind of water absorbed in it, which is called humidity, okay? So air can store unseen water, this humidity. Okay? The amount of water will depend on the temperature you are in. This is why in hot areas, you'll find that humidity is felt in a more obvious way than cold areas. So the warmer the air, the more water per cubic meter of, air, of water can be there. Warmer air can absorb more water. As air cools, when the air starts to cool, the amount of water it can store falls. So it has to spill or to extract water. If air cools significantly, if the cooling happens in a very fast way, the storage capacity can cool in such a way that the excess water is spilled from the air. Then you can find something like uh, evaporation or you can find drain, as an example. Then we have something called dew point. The dew point is the temperature at which, so it's a temperature at which the air is 100% saturated by water. So this is a special case. When you are increasing water, increasing temperature, so the heat can absorb more water, and once the heat reaches 100% of water, then this is the dew point. And when the dew point, which means that the relative humidity is 100%, the air is already saturated with water vapor, 
Then evaporation and condensation are in perfect equilibrium. So normally, when the dew point is exceeds, then condensation appears. So you start might even see rain. It exceeds the air can absorb additional humidity. It dries. Okay. The higher the relative humidity, the higher the dew point temperature. Of course, the dew point is also influenced by air pressure. So it differs depending on the air pressure. Relative humidity, as you can see from this graph, from this chart, that when you have higher temperature, then you have higher relative humidity or water on the air, and vice versa. This is what you need to understand from that. Again, relative humidity, as you can see, depends on the temperature you have. So relative humidity, Greek phi, indicates as a percentage how saturated the air is with water vapor at a specific temperature. This is the definition. Absolute humidity indicates the water itself, content of the air in gram per kilogram, and the humidity of is 100%. The air is saturated and has reached maximum excess air moisture. Okay, you can see here that with low temperature, humidity is less. As temperature goes high, humidity is going high. Okay. Some facts about the relative humidity because this is very important for your health. So if humidity is less than a specific amount or higher than a specific amount, it will it will have some implications or negative effect on your health. So the healthiest indoor climate is 50% relative humidity. Okay. So depending on the study, you should have something around 50% relative humidity at 20 Celsius room temperature. If the ambient should be not fall below 30%, so 30% less than 30% is not healthy, and more than 70% is not healthy. So the optimum you have is 50%, and from 30% to 70%. Okay. If humidity is high, you can get something related to uh, mold growth, which also will lead to a bad smell in the house. And can lead to bacteria or even some disease as well. So most refills are something warmer than dry air. The ideal ambient humidity is lower winter than in summer, of course. Lower the outdoor temperature, the lower the optimal humidity. Warmer rooms should exhibit lower humidity than colder rooms, of course. The highest the room temperature, the lower the optimal humidity. We talked about that. Okay. So as you can see, some facts about that. Most we need to understand that when the temperature is high, the humidity is high. And the optimal temperature is 20 C, and the optimal humidity for your health and to avoid mold getting or mold generation is from 30% to 70%. Now, talking about the comfort that depending on your action, then temperature should be there to have a comfortable way of living. And depending on your action, thermal energy will be getting out of your body. So if you ha are having normal activities, then thermal temperature comes from your body. The person is in what? Almost 100. But if you are going to a gym or something like that, then it might go to from 200 or 250. And depending on that, you have to understand that the temperature setting, as we will see later in our chapter, the temperature settings you put in your system will depend on the type of activity you have, which depends on the type of room you have. So the temperature settings, I need to do in a gym room or in a, in a plant is different than the one I need to do in a bedroom where people are sleeping. So mostly they have normal activity or even less than normal activity. So less than 100 watt. Operating temperature, this operating temperature, which is theta, is the average of the temperatures of the surrounding surface and the ambient air. So if I'm sitting here, the around me is the ambient air. But the surrounding surface itself, like the wall, they had a different temperature as well. And the operating temperature is the average between those, those both, the air ambient temperature, ambient air temperature, and the surrounding surface I have. A difference between the wall temperature and room temperature is called the withdrawal or thermal radiation withdrawal. A one-sided decrease in heat is deemed thermally uncomfortable. So if one area is very hot, and then the area around me is cold and the difference is high, then it's not, uh, not comfortable for us, okay? Uh, which is a different a differentiation between wall and room. It should be around 4.5K Kelvin to have a comfortable uh, feeling. The effect primarily arises near windows and cooled room service because in the around window, it's 
so close to the outside temperature, so it will be hot, it will be cold, sorry. Normally in the in the house itself, it will be hotter. So around window, it not it will not be that comfortable because the average temperature between the ambient air and the surrounding surface would be uh, not around 4.5 K. Okay. This is simply what we had in the chapter, a very simple chapter with totally theory parts. You'll need to understand or to memorize all what you have here. The equations will come in the exam. You can open the book. So you don't have to under to, to memorize the equations. You just need to understand the normal way uh, and the difference between the different units of the of temperature. Okay, this is for this chapter. If you have any questions, just let me know and I'll see you tomorrow, inshallah, in the other chapter, which is the heat distribution system. Uh,